Did you know that people fear dementia more than cancer? And right now there are no cures for diseases like Alzheimer's, but there are preventative measures like the five core strategies that we're gonna talk about today. I'm Dr. Shabnam Das Kar, a functional medicine doctor and a brain health coach. I teach people uh, how to improve their focus, get rid of brain fog and prevent dementia down the line. And I'm Andrea Spiros. I'm a professional speaker and I work with organizations to harness the power of high powered habits so they can increase engagement, resilience, and well being. Today, we're going to talk about the five core strategies to improve brain health sleep, eat, move, mind body, and therapeutic supplementation. You may remember the three foundations of optimal brain health, which are optimal blood glucose levels optimal blood pressure, and low inflammation. If you missed that episode, go and check it out in the podcast where we do a great overview of those three. And remember, we're going to do deep dives in those three and more on these five core strategies. Once you know these five core strategies, then you can take the action toward improving them. And they're already, if you're already great, then you can still learn more about the framework so you understand what you're doing, why you're doing it so well, what's working, and if anything goes wrong, you'll know what to address. So Shabnam, let's talk about the first of the strategies, sleep. Tell us more about why sleep's important. So uh, sleep is something that, you know, Mother Nature has designed it in such a way that we spend about one third of our life in a state where if you think back to our hunter-gatherer ancestors, that, you know, that was a time when we were vulnerable to, you know, wild animals, to predation. So obviously mother nature had a great plan. Otherwise, why would she put us, she or he, put us in that state where we are vulnerable to so many things. So it's just recently that we are finding out more and more about sleep and how it impacts long-term health. And maybe Andrea, one of the reasons is if we look at statistics, we were sleeping a whole lot more, even I think as little as 25 years ago. Wow. Would, would you agree with uh, agree with that? So Andrea, if you think back to your childhood, do you feel that we were sleeping more then? Oh, yes. I think, yes. Uh, I definitely sleep. Um, sleep was a, was a big thing. I was definitely sleeping more and the people around me were definitely sleeping more. So what does sleep do for, for the brain specifically? So when it comes to sleep, there are a few things. Number one is the duration of sleep. Short sleep duration, so shorter than six and a half hours of sleep every night, has been associated with a lot of mental health problems, with higher risk for dementia, with more of Alzheimer's. And interestingly, a lot of this has come from studies done in younger people. So it's not like only people who have dementias like Alzheimer's disease who have shorter sleep or they have sleep disruptions. What they found is even in people in their middle age, if they did not have good quality sleep, many years down the line, their risk for dementia was much higher. So that is one with sleep duration. The next is, of course, sleep quality. So sleep quality, very easy way to find out whether you have good sleep quality is to ask yourself in the morning, do you feel rested? And another question that I usually ask patients is, do you dream? So why, what connection does dream have with it? And we still don't know why we dream, but what we do know is uh, dreaming is, that, is a particular stage in, in our sleep. So again, we are going to do deep dive into sleep. So I'm not going into sleep architecture and all those things today. But if you uh, dream, and then of course, some people don't remember their dreams. So if you dream and if you feel rested when you wake up in the morning, and of course, the sleep duration as well, those are a rough measure of sleep. And more importantly, if you sleep poorly, whether it is low, you know, less duration or poor quality sleep, are you able to function well the same the, uh, the next morning or the next day? And you know, this is where Andrea. Sometimes I feel you know people like you, 
who are high performers. I think um, I'm sure you have had this experience as well, that even with poor sleep, if you have something major happening the next day, you just barrel through the day, right? Yes, that is a key factor of being a high performer. And even some people who aren't that if there is something I really need to show up for, no matter what kind of night's sleep I got, I will show up and no one will be the wiser. I might crash afterwards. I might be very crabby with my family and friends, but I will get through it, uh, you know, no matter what kind of night's sleep I've had. And so I want to point out to people that there's a couple of the, the two things we're really looking at is your sleep duration and your sleep quality as being important to how you feel. And then your own metric is going to be, how do you feel? Do you feel clear? Do you feel positive? Do you feel like you have energy or do you feel foggy and sluggish and crabby and like you're dragging yourself through the day because you're your own best metric. If you feel fine and you're not having adverse consequences, then you're probably doing okay with your sleep. If you're having brain fog, if you're having some trouble, then start with sleep. What are some ways, some strategies that, that people can uh, use to improve their sleep. So, uh, Andrea, before we move to strategies, I just want to, because I know many people like to know why do we need sleep for our brain? So yes. What happens, what happens when we sleep? Two major things. And we, there is so much we are finding out about sleep now. So today in 2022, these are the two things we know, maybe some few months down the line, there'll be more things coming up. Number one is memory consolidation. So what does it mean? What it means is essentially memory is going into the, you know, going into storage. Because like from short term to long term. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so as we know, you know, when we talk about dementia or any kind of cognitive decline, even sort of the milder symptoms sometimes we may experience after a poor night's sleep. One of the things is, you know, your memory loss. You don't, you can't remember something or you go into a room and you feel that, oh, why did I come in here? And then you go back and you come back again to remember that. Now, all of that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have dementia, you know, in, in a few months time, but those are the things that are important. So one is memory consolidation. The second thing is, this is very interesting research, which has, which came up in the last few years, that uh, during sleep is when the brain detoxifies. So throughout the day, see, this is the interesting thing about the brain. Because the brain is involved with everything we do, whether we are, you know, how well we breathe, how well our heart beats, how well our thinking works, how well our muscles move, how well our gut functions, everything is related to brain function. So the brain doesn't get much rest throughout the day because it has to keep all these things working. So nighttime is when the brain detoxifies. And that is, a, you know, this is a system about which I did not study in med school many years ago. So this is called the glymphatic system, G-L-Y-M-P-H-A-T-I-C, distinct from the lymphatic system. So glymphatic system is what is supposed to work at night and therefore, if we reduce the number of hours we sleep at night, the brain does not get enough time to detoxify. So that those are the two major, uh, you know, and then of course comes the problems of mood issues. If you do not sleep well. So in the, you know, mental health world, there is a lot of discussion now about, we know that people who have, you know, uh, severe depression or any of the other mental health challenges, sleep, even, you know, one of the earliest symptoms of Alzheimer's is sleep problems. But so the thinking back then was, okay, so that is a symptom of the disease, but now slowly the thinking is moving away from, okay, you know, sleep is a uh, sleep loss is a symptom of depression, but now we are slowly moving towards the thinking that maybe, you know, not sleeping enough is causative of all, all these mental health challenges. And Andrea, I think that is so important for young people, particularly because they think that, okay, I don't need to sleep really. I will sleep. It's a luxury. I will sleep when I die or any of that. Yeah. And then, and that's a typical one of high performers too. I'll sleep when I die or, or something like that. And, and um, I think that's also woven in to a lot of societies. That's that if you are sleeping, you're lazy, or if you're sleeping, there's 
something wrong. Like you should be working more often than not. And I think it's telling that now we're starting to see that there might be some causative uh, issues where sleep is actually causing some problems and not just being a lack of sleep being a symptom of it, uh, of whatever the, the issue is like depression. And I, and I can say we prioritize sleep in, in my family, even my, I have two teens, well, I have one teenager now and, uh, he prioritizes sleep. Sometimes he goes to bed earlier than me. <laughs> yeah, Andrea, that's like, you reminded me, our son is 27. He lives with us and sometimes he goes off to bed before I do. So <laughs> yes, that it's, is. I take that as a, as a pat on the back to my parenting, uh, to my parenting that, that they, <laughs> my, my children are prioritizing sleep and that they recognize a lot of times my children will recognize, um, oh, I'm feeling weepy and to, to them, that's a sign that they need more rest. You know, weepy for no reason, oh. I'll say, right? And they'll say, oh, you know what? I'm weepy that I, I didn't get a lot of sleep last night or it's, it's much later. I've been up for a long time. And they, they, they're putting two and two together to then take the proper action of, oh, I need to get more rest. So, for, so if you're listening out there, you probably have some symptoms of lack of sleep they could be just being short tempered or crabby. It could be actually feeling tired. It could be like one of my children feeling weepy. Uh, and then if you want to try to identify those for yourself, so then then you know, oh, I'll get I'll I can get some more sleep for that. Yeah. And when it comes to sleep, one more, and we are going to do a deep dive into it. One group of people are those, as Andrea, you mentioned, who they will sleep when they die, sort of, they don't prioritize. Yeah. Another group, and particularly a lot of you know, women and perimenopausal, menopausal women go through that, is chronic insomnia. So you have problem falling asleep, staying asleep. And as I keep saying, we are going to do deep dives into all of them. And the third category is sleep disorders. That is in the world of the neurologist and sleep medicine specialist. But we will, you know, sort of discuss those things on when you should, obviously you need to meet your uh, doctor for those things, but those are for another episode. So uh, Andrea, what are some of the strategies people could use to get a better quality, I mean, be get a better night of sleep? Well, one of my favorite ones is actually um, to go to bed when you're sleepy. So there's a lot of um, you know, go to bed at a certain hour and do this and do that. But if you're not actually sleepy, that can actually set yourself, set you up for failure where you're laying in bed wide awake. Um, so it does require that you stay in tune with yourself and in touch with yourself to know, oh, I'm, I'm getting a little sleepy. Now I'll start to wind down. The other, another one is to have a bedtime routine. Now, you know, this, this might seem like a thing that you do with little kids, but it's really powerful as an adult to have a routine specific to you of all the things you do to wind down. Um, you know, whether it's turning off your tech, whether it's opening a book, whether it's getting into your night clothes or listening to some soothing music or meditating, whatever it is, a routine that you do uh, nightly to signal to your body that this is the time that you're going to go to bed and prepare, prepare yourself for sleep. Um, what about like on weekends, Shabnam, do you, do you have any tips for, for people on, on weekends and how they so, should handle their sleep? <laughs> That's a good question. So what, ha one of the things that people feel, particularly those who do not prioritize sleep is I'll just catch up on my sleep during the weekend. Now our bodies are designed in such a way that a regularity, the rhythm, so that is essentially a biological clock, that rhythm needs to be kept the same during weekdays and weekends. See, our bodies don't know what is a weekend, what is a weekday. It just knows when the sun <laughs> rises, <laughs> the body's clock should start working, particularly when you, you know, your eyes are exposed to bright sunlight. So yeah. <laughs> having the same bedtime and wake up time um, during the weekdays as well as weekends is again a very important strategy and the the thing is you know it, it's like there is no one best strategy what you mentioned about going to bed when you're asleep 
That is very important, particularly for people who have chronic insomnia. And find out what it is for you. It's not like, you know, don't drink coffee at 10 a.m. You know, after 10 a.m., you need to stop. And immediately, you know, Andrea, I'll have someone pointing out, I can drink coffee at 3 p.m. and still go to sleep. Everyone is different. You know? Exactly, exactly. And that's where that's where uh, we'll go a little bit more deeper into this. So I heard two things there is to, another strategy is to consistently have wake and sleep times, even on the weekend. So make it work for you so that your body knows and, and can get in its own routine. And then to get out of bed and expose yourself to some, some sunlight or get out of bed when you, you know, as soon as you wake up so that your body then, you know, knows like it is actually time to wake up. So let's talk about um, eating and, and well, we all know eating is important. <laughs> there's some keys, there's some keys to eating. So why don't you share the keys to, to food? Okay. So, and again, we are going to do deep dive into all of it. So when it comes to food, what, how I describe it is what you eat is of course, extremely important, but when you eat food and how many times you eat food and also in what order you eat food, like, are you eating carbohydrate first versus eating protein first? So what, when, how many times, in what order, and probably, Andrea, to that, I could also add, you know, in what sort of company are you eating the food? Are you, I, you know, I think that's, so, I think you should add that. I think you should add that because uh, there's, I, I don't know the person who said this, but it's, they, they said, basically, it's not necessarily, you know, what you eat sometimes, it's, it's who you're being when you're doing it. So if you're, feeling really frustrated with your, whoever you're eating with, or you're eating in a rush around a whole bunch of people who are shoveling food in your mouth, maybe not, uh, that's got to affect it. That's got to affect things. Yeah, that is so important because, you know, quite often we talk about, you know, you don't, you shouldn't drink alcohol late in the evening because it interferes with your sleep. And then that would interfere with your brain function and all of that. But, you know, just because that is something I know does it mean I'm not going to enjoy the glass of red wine when I'm with my friends and we are having some really stimulating conversation? Of course not. You know, I'm going to. Yeah, have we got to live a little. But and then knowing, I think that the key here too is then knowing like that that could happen. So if you do wake up in the night, you're not upset or thinking there's something really wrong. You can just acknowledge, oh, I had a glass of wine. This isn't a chronic thing, but really you're at choice and you can really enjoy it. I, I totally relate. I want to um, enjoy good food and good company. Okay. So uh, when it comes to food, we are going to do a deeper dive into food, but recent studies, very interestingly, Andrea, are showing that sometimes when you eat, maybe even more important than what you eat. Now, I'm not saying people should not eat, you know, good quality food, but when you eat that good quality food, so maybe you are eating the best possible food, you're eating, you know, freshly grown vegetables in from your farmer's market, and you're getting, you know, wild fish and things like that, but you still finish your meal regularly, not once in a while, at like 8.30, 9 p.m., and then you are trying to go to bed by 11, so that's just two hours before you, uh, after you finish eating. So even if you have eaten, and by you, I don't mean you, Andrea, I know you eat. Yeah, better. anyone who's listening, anyone, yeah. even if you've eaten the perfect meal, the yeah. perfectly healthy meal that any and all experts would agree is the pinnacle of all meals to eat for optimal health. Even if you did that, yes, you're eating two hours before bedtime. <laughs> that is not going to give you the best results. So when it comes to food, what does food do for the brain? And Andrea, you mentioned at the beginning of the episode, we talked about optimal blood glucose levels, optimal blood pressure levels, and low levels of chronic inflammation. Food impacts all those areas. And we'll do much deeper dives into what type of food. And in, in the food world, Andrea, I mean, I'm sure you have you read as much as I do about all the different, oh, you need to eat just this type of food and nothing oh, else. Yes. <laughs> Keto, paleo, this and that, all veggies, vegan, 
a vegetarian. I mean, there's so many different strategies out there. Um, but it, it sounds like we can pick, you can, if you're listening, you can pick a healthy strategy for you and then apply these principles of, you know, eating, stopping your food intake three to four hours before bedtime, whatever that means for you. And can you talk a little bit about the order of things? Is there a a specific order? Okay. So these are again supported by studies where they looked at people, the same meal. And of course, some of the meals they tested were not like very healthy meals, like fruit juice and bread. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, even those meals, which were not probably the best ones, what they found is if people ate the carbohydrates first. So like, you know, the reason restaurants serve us bread first is because they want us to eat more, obviously. Yeah. So when people ate higher carbohydrate food first and protein and fat later, their blood glucose response was much higher than when they changed the food order and they ate the protein and fat first and carbohydrates last. So these are like simpler changes than changing, because food is one of the biggest challenges people have, particularly making dietary changes. Like you're eating a certain way and you feel that, okay, I cannot give up my bread, you know? So (laughs) Exactly. So you don't have to give up your bread right away. You can just switch it. Like that's a great tiny habits recipe right there is just after I sit down with my plate, my first bite, I will take a bite of protein. Yeah. Right. That can be an easy thing. And that's a way for people to not feel denied uh, about changing their, their, whatever they're eating. I'll use diet and mean, meaning what you're eating, not as in a prescribed way of, of, uh, as a more of a prescribed way of eating. And so that can be a great way to just start with your protein and, um, move through the veg to the carbs, or at least starting with protein is a great tiny habits recipe. Oh, and, yeah. and I think you, I think you have a, you like to say, add, what do you say? Add first, subtract yeah. later. Oh yeah. So, you know, th- because whenever it comes to food, people have this feeling of, oh, now I have to stop eating a whole bunch of stuff, things that I absolutely love and I cannot live without. And my ancestors have been eating that <laughs> <laughs> instead of focusing on the deprivation what I always suggest is how about focus on what you're adding? So adding more protein. And again, we'll go into in all of these in details because protein and good quality fat will not raise your blood glucose levels. So, and they, they keep you satiated much longer versus eating more carbohydrates. So things like pasta, rice, bread, these will make you hungrier quicker rather than a nice good steak or some fish, or if you're vegetarian, you know, tofu or cottage cheese or whatever your favorite protein is, you will notice that yourself. I mean, you don't have to deliberately, you know, measure how much you're eating and, you know, you will find that you feel full faster. So you won't be able to eat a lot anyway. And, uh, you know, one of the things, Andrea, because people are so used to the portion control, you need to use a smaller plate. Once you start eating the way your body works well, you will not have to deliberately, you know, use motivation and will force to reduce your portion size. You automatically, your your body will say, don't eat anymore. You're full. (laughs) And I think that's what everybody wants. I think that, that societies, some, many societies have really trained everyone to be very into portion control to, to not think about what their body needs and to eat a certain way, like the carbs first, you know, is trained by bread and restaurants and things like that. And this strategy that you're talking about is really just about shifting and then noticing. So do you want to talk about a few more strategies around eating? And then one more, on one more it. strategy is around how many times you eat. So Andrea, we think we eat three meals, but so they did a study where they actually tracked people uh, throughout the day and night. And what they found is people eat for 14 to 15 hours a day. So eat and drink, drink sugary stuff. Right. So it's not just three major meals. It's three meals, whole bunch of snacks and whole lot of, you know, other things in between. 
And what happens each time you we eat something or drink something sugary, our insulin and blood glucose levels go up. And if you, if you think to the foundations of brain health, we want to keep insulin and blood glucose levels even keeled. So obviously, if you're eating multiple times, whether it is snacking on even something as good as a little bit of nuts, you know, uh, first of all, find out why are you snacking? Is it boredom? For me, Andrea, very often it's like boredom. You know, You're I work... not the only one. I, I, I totally, I mean, I hear that all the time. You know, I'm bored as in people are standing in front of uh, the cupboard. And I think a great question is, and I think this is, I'm going to forget her name, but she does a mindful eating program, Dr. Michelle, somebody, and she asked this question, why am I eating? All right. So oh. another great tiny recipe could be, you know, after you find yourself in the kitchen or wherever your food is, the pantry or the fridge, ask yourself, why am I eating? And, and then if it's boredom, what should we do? So if it's boredom, again, each person is different. Uh, find out what else you can do. Is it like maybe can you drink a glass of water or have a glass of have a cup of you know herbal tea? Uh, or is it possible that you know you can just go out for a walk or maybe you distract your that is what I try sometimes because I work mostly from home. I decide, yeah. okay, instead of eating, let me just go down to the basement and start my laundry. So that ah, do a chore. I love it. Do a chore. People now uh, people all over are gonna have uh, clean laundry because they're gonna start doing that. <laughs> I mean, and sometimes what can happen is even just asking yourself that question yeah. will give you enough agency to go, oh, I don't really, I don't really need to eat right now. And, and you can, you can refocus yourself. Uh, but also in the tiny habits method, uh, we do want to make clear that you can still eat after that. You your yeah. tiny habit recipe can be after I find myself at the fridge, I will ask, why am I eating? And you ask that question and then you go, you know, grab the cupcake anyway that's okay. It, you're just giving yourself some agency so that you can then shift in the future. And sometimes just asking that question will turn your, to turn you around. Um, yeah. What are and some, so many times I've asked, you know, patients, okay, why, uh, why do you need to snack? Are you hungry? If you're hungry, obviously we've got to look at the meal before. And sometimes, you know, I see that, that little pause, and many a time patients will tell me, doctor, I have never thought why I eat wow. that. Wow, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think that food serves so many purposes that sometimes we, we are not trained to think about why we are eating. Yeah. Okay, so off, this is the uh, acronym that, I, that we use, S-E-M-M-T. So now we have reached the first M. Yes, move. So S E M M T, sleep, eat, move, mind, body, and therapeutic supplementation. We've gone through the first uh, two, and we're on to the first M, which is move. And that, and and uh, I think move is self-explanatory in terms of, you know, obviously not sedentary. But talk a, a little bit more about it because there's a few things I think. Sometimes when we talk about movement, people think it must be heavy exercise. They must have to do something hard. They might have to go to the gym. They start creating all these stories for themselves. And they tend to be stories that make movement very hard. But that's not what you're talking about necessarily. So tell us a little bit more about movement. Yes. And so so often, Andrea, I'll have people ask me, so Shabnam, tell me, what is the best exercise for me? I said, the best exercise for you is the one you will do. Yes. <laughs> Second that. <laughs> So when Andrea and I are talking about movement, yes, everybody knows that we need to exercise that I even I know I need to exercise, but I don't exercise as much as I should. And worldwide, this is a problem. Everyone knows we have these huge, wonderful guidelines, which says you need to exercise for a certain number of minutes every day. But what makes it challenging is because people very often think that I, like you said, Andrea, I need to do certain exercise. Only this is beneficial. Other things like walking or standing, none of that is beneficial. That is not true. Any amount of movement, whether you are doing household work, that counts as well. And in fact, recent Canadian guidelines has even included standing. So my four point summary of, you know, movement is move more. 
because we by the way we work nowadays you know it's been designed such that we spend a lot of time on laptops or computers or other things so we end up sitting a whole lot more than we used to before and continuous sitting is much worse than smoking because you know it it increases your inflammation levels it reduces your muscle mass it makes your brain more foggy if you can't spend a lot of time sitting and more importantly, even if you go to the gym in the morning or you walked your dog for like 5,000 steps a uh, in a certain number of uh, time, and then you come to the office and sit continuously for six to 10 hours or eight hours, that completely, you know, takes away the benefits of the exercise in the morning. So move more, sit less, stand some. So obviously you're not supposed to stand all the time, like, so one decision I made a few years ago was to get rid of my chair in my in my home office so that I'm not even tempted to sit. And every time I have a Zoom meeting, I always stand so that I don't have the chair, so I'm not tempted to sit. And Andrea, I remember you spoke at some event sometime back. And one of the things you mentioned, because you speak professionally so often, I remember one of your tips was to stand when you speak even if yes. it's on zoom I mean when you're on stage obviously you're standing yeah but even on zoom it's and I I stand and I'm standing now I I for me uh you know and in terms of public speaking too you project differently you're more active you're more engaged I find my brain is sharper then when I'm sitting down I think it has something to do with you know the, how the body is wired that sitting is a different energy from standing. And I think also the lungs too, right? I, you're able to project more if you're standing. Oftentimes we sit and are, are crunched over. So I stand, I stand so much that my uh, Apple watch tells me to stand even when I'm standing because it thinks I'm sitting. So <laughs> <laughs> <gasps> and let's talk about like when you're exercising, I think some people, People think that they have to go with this. I mean, there there is high intensity interval training and things like that. But you know, when we're talking for for everyday people who just want to get a little healthier, what's the intensity level of the exercise? I mean, obviously, any any more movement is great. Like if you're if you're if you're just sitting around the house and you never stand, if you stand, that's great. If you take a walk around the block, that's great. Like that that improvement's going to help. If you're wanting to take it to another level, what is the level of intensity that people should be working out at? Okay, so the level of intensity, again, you'll find lots of recommendations in the guidelines, which says moderate intensity activity for uh, 150 to 300 minutes a week, which turns out to be about 20 to 40 minutes a day is extremely important. But if you are doing higher intensity uh, activities, then the duration can be much lower. So how do you know whether it's a moderate intensity activity? And this is where you know there's a cardiologist of, uh, uh, out of Yale, Dr. Kapil Parak. He described this very beautifully. So you need to huff and puff. <laughs> how would you know otherwise if you are, you know, you're, go you're doing moderate intensity exercise because you won't be looking at even if you have a, you know, a fitness tracker, you're not going to check your heart rate at that point. So right. A rough measure is if you're huffing and puffing for 20 to 40 minutes or the other description, and I'll tell you what Jennifer said. So the other description is if you are doing moderate intensity activity, you can have a conversation, but you cannot sing. I love that one. I love that one. And I even once you told me that you can have a conversation, but you cannot sing. I started to see the activity that I do. I have a, a couple hills that I walk up and I realized like, yes, this is the right activity level because I could talk to someone, but I definitely could not sing walking up the steeper hill. And that's a great way for people to know you're out and about. Even if you have a fitness tracker, you'll just know for yourself that this is the right the right level of intensity for you. And it doesn't have to be that intense. You know, you don't have to go full out. Just 20, as little as 20 minutes a day of uh, conversational but not singing movement is going to improve your uh, brain health and your overall health. Yes, so and one more important factor is when you exercise. Now, you will notice that in our conversations, 
the when part comes very often. So the circadian rhythm, and we are going to talk about all those and all that on a different episode. So uh, moving or, you know, even walking for just two minutes, two minutes is absolutely nothing after a meal versus, you know, at any other time of the day. Uh, keeps your blood glucose levels much better. And if you can walk 10 minutes after a meal and three times a day, instead of half an hour continuously in the morning, the blood glucose response, if you do that, you know, after meals has been much better in many people than if you just do the 30 minutes of continuous walking at, at a stretch. So if you feel that I don't have 30 minutes, I don't have half an hour to spare, just do whatever you can. So when it comes to movement, any improvement, and you know, Andrea, you put it so well, any improvement over your baseline is going to give you a whole lot of long-term benefits. And sometimes I, I have to tell my patients because they'll say, oh, doctor, I've been walking more for the last one week. I didn't really notice much except for my mood is better. I said, <laughs> except for my mood is except better. For, yeah. <laughs> I, said, I didn't see any weight loss. I said, no, you're not going to see any weight loss in a week. <laughs> and, and I think people often don't know we have a set metric. So a lot of people, what I hear is they have a set metric about what the consequence or what the result is going to be from a certain action. Right. And when they don't see it match up to what they think is the result, sometimes they think it's not working. Right. And that's clearly, clearly indicated by your, your patient where your patient thought, if I start moving more, I, the result will be losing weight when really the impact at the, at the beginning was they started moving more and their mood improved. And then guess what's going to happen after that? Their mood is going to improve. They're going to probably have more energy to eat better, to make better food choices, and maybe even to move more, which will then lead to the overall long-term result that they might want in that situation. So I think it's really important when you make these changes to look for the improvements in all areas of your life because they're holistic, yeah. right? And their sleep might improve. You and I were discussing that for you, you notice that you sleep better when you have over 8,000 steps a day. Yes. And that when you have under 8,000 steps a day, you don't sleep as well. And I was noticing that for myself. It was very hot where I live. I did not take my normal walk. And I had a couple nights where it wasn't terrible sleep, but I didn't sleep as deeply. And I realized it was because I hadn't moved in that way. And so now I've uh, made the change for myself that when it's hot outside, I do some other form of movement because I know that that will improve my sleep. Should we move on to the mind-body interventions So and talk mind, about what those are? Yes, mind-body interventions are, there could be so many different ways of doing them. Things like mindfulness, meditation, prayer, you know, Tai Chi, Qigong, uh, you know, walking outside in nature or just a mindful walking. Now, one of the things, Andrea, I'm sure you have found people talking about this as well. Mind-body interventions can be many different things, but what in terms of, in medical terms, we are looking for is what is called a relaxation response. So whatever you do, and again, you get to choose what works best for you. If yoga is not something you like, then don't go for yoga. You know? Yeah, don't do, don't do something you don't want to do. Yeah. Because the best type I of mind body, I mean, mind body technique is the type of technique that you will do. Yeah. And I don't know, Andrea, if there are any studies on that. If you are compelled to do something you don't want to do, I have a serious suspicion it's not going to show the same benefits. You know, I don't know if there's any studies, but I can I I, I have an intuition. I mean, that that it's probably not uh, going to have as, as impactful. I mean, I, no. I do I do yoga and I and I want to do yoga. But I can imagine that if I if I didn't want to do it and someone made me do the things that I do, I would be angry the whole time. And that can't be good for my for my <laughs> overall health and well-being. <laughs> yeah. I that's I think I'm, and I think you know, we are looking at things that you can sustain long term. And yes. I don't think anyone has figured out how they can sustain something they don't like doing. <laughs> Yeah, there's very few. I mean, even in behavior design with, you know, the bigger picture of BJ Fogg's work, um, there's there's usually an action that you can pick, a behavior that you can pick that's going to give you the result you want and you can get behind it. 
right? It's that it's something that you want to do. There's very few things in life where there's no other options and, and those we have a solution for. But generally, if you're talking sleeping, eating, moving, mind-body techniques, even supplements, you're going to have a choice about the ones that work for you, and then you want to choose them. Um, and we'll do a deeper dive in, um, in that. So how long and how often should we be doing these uh, intervention okay. techniques? Okay. And is there, we'll, we'll ask the, the eternal question, when should we do these techniques too? <laughs> so when it comes to, so what is the relaxation response? Number one is whatever it is that you do, it should reduce your pulse rate. It should reduce your breathing rate. And it should reduce your blood pressure as well. Now, you may not be measuring all these things. And I know, Andrea, you are a long-term meditator. I've been meditating for, I don't know, 12, 15 years, I think. I forget how long. Yeah. And I write prescriptions for meditation. Now, again, meditation has nothing to do with religion. Uh, you know, some people it's have- just a quieting of the mind. When yeah. we say meditation, it's, a, it's anything that can quiet your mind and slow your breathing and your heart rate. So when it comes to duration, again, a lot of the studies have shown, you know, half an hour um, every day for eight weeks. Most of the programs are for eight weeks or so. But some studies have shown that even lower- uh, you know, duration, even five minutes a day. And again, it's it's like different things for different people. Figure out what works best for you. I decided uh, some weeks ago that I want to increase my daily meditation to at least half an hour. So I set a timer. I put my phone on uh, you know, airplane mode so that I don't get any calls or any notifications or anything. And that was how I decided to increase my meditation time. Versus if I don't use a timer, I probably meditate for about you know, 17, 18 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so, and some days are I'm super rushed. So then I'm fine. I'm happy with a 15 minute meditation. So if you are new to this, you're thinking I need to start meditation. Just start with one minute and figure out some ways, you know, get onto some app on the phone, try out a whole bunch of free stuff before you subscribe to any one of them. Or maybe go for a drop-in class, meditation class, and see how you feel. So different ways of doing it. And there is no, like I keep saying, there's no one right way. That's the beautiful thing about this is that there's so many options that there's something that everyone who's listening can find that they actually want to do and feel good doing. And, and a great tiny habit recipe would be just after I, you know, you pick your prompt after I finish my morning coffee, I will sit in my meditation spot or I will take three mindful breaths, right? You can start there and then expand it or even just opening your app. If you are testing out an app after I, you know, sit down at my desk, I will open my meditation app and go from there. And that way you can start playing around with um, you know, what, what works for you? Yeah. And the other question you asked, Andrea, is when should you meditate? Again, it's entirely up to you. Many of like, I like meditating in the morning. That's a part of my morning routine. And, you know, but then there are days when I meditate in the middle of the day as well. If I feel my mind is going, you know, all zoo, zoo, zoo in all directions, yes. I, I need to just sit down for five minutes and, you know, get into my inner silence. And I'm sure you, you have experienced that as well. Yes. And those are the, to me, those are the most important times to meditate and the most time where I'm resistant. And I have a long-term meditator. I have a lot of different meditation practices and tools. Those are the most important times when your mind's going zoom, zoom, zoom. And maybe you're feeling kind of tied up inside that can also serve as a prompt to say, like, after I feel those feelings, I will open my meditation app or I'll sit in my meditation spot, or I will even just close my computer and take a few deep breaths um, to help you reset during the day. And, and sometimes it doesn't take that long. Once you start, you know, it doesn't mean you're going to commit to a half hour practice in the middle of the day just to calm yourself down. But once you get going, you can in a few minutes, at least reset so that you're not, uh, you know, so, so keyed up. Yes. And another thing is a lot of people find you talked about the, you know, the ritual before sleep. Some people find that, you know, meditating at the end of the day kind of makes them calmer. 
So find out what works best for you. And there is no one time which is best for everyone. And it's a good permission slip for you to find out what really works for you. So let's move on to the T, therapeutic supplementation, which sounds very challenging, uh, but it's it's not. So talk to us. I mean, I think a lot of people are really familiar with supplements and vitamins and all sorts of things like that. Um, they can see the the you know recommended daily allowances on the back of a lot of food packaging and things like that. How is this different? So when I say therapeutic, it means this is a supplement level, which is more than the RDA. So you mentioned the recommended dietary allowance. So you will find, you know, as you said, everywhere there will be RDA for blah, blah, blah is this much. So the recommended dietary allowances were, you know, created at a time when people were dealing with severe deficiency diseases things like rickets, you know, vitamin D deficiency, scurvy, beriberi. These are like very severe deficiencies of, you know, there are these stories of, I think, was it British soldiers, uh, sailors who right, right. had scurvy and then they found that having lemons on the, on the ship prevented right. them. From, and scurvy, beriberi, rickets, these are like extreme nutritional deficiencies. So most of the RDA were formulated with those things in mind. They did not think of the brain when they were coming up with the RDAs. It was more preventative against body diseases, not necessarily yeah. optimal functioning uh, yeah. of the brain and body. So when I say therapeutic, it means studies have actually shown benefits using do that dosage of that particular supplements. Now, one of the commonest examples is omega-3 fatty acids. So we all know that fatty fish would give us omega-3 fatty acids. And omega-3s are what are called essential fatty acids. That means our bodies don't have the ability to make them. So obviously, we have to either eat them, either as food or as food and supplements. Now, here is where I say where supplementation has a big role. Because, uh, for example, you know, in Canada, the recommendation for fish is two servings of fish a week. Now, two servings of even wild caught fish, wild caught salmon, provided you love salmon, some people don't. Right. So even if you eat those two servings of, you know, the recommended ones, you will not get all the omega-3s you need. And again, interestingly, omega-3s don't have an RDA. Interesting. So, Interesting. <laughs> and we have enough studies now to show that supplements or any of these, you know, multiple different um, vitamins and mi micronutrients don't work in isolation. So a very important study. And again, we'll go into these in details. There is a very important study called the Vitacog study, where they gave uh, people B vitamins and omega-3s. And what they found is B vitamins were beneficial for the brain when the person had enough omega-3s. Mm. So just supplementing with, there is no one magic supplement or herb or any of that. Right. You need to get the whole picture going, but don't, we don't want anyone to stress out because yeah. we'll take it piece by piece, but this is a really a new way to think about everything so that in a more holistic way with the strategies that you need to focus on so that you know where to go, what to do and how to tweak it. So uh, what else about like, can people just, can people, should they just start taking omega-3s and Bs? What do they need to do? So uh, omega-3s and Bs are what are called supplements. So basically what it means, like I said, is it has to come from food or supplements. And next is herbs. So supplements are things that we are supposed to anyway get. And with omega-3s, one of the best ways to do in, in my world of functional medicine, we always say, why guess when you can test? So there is an omega-3 test available. There's an omega-3 index where you can measure uh, the amount of omega-3, omega-6 trans fats in your blood. And I'm going to add a link to that testing on the, on the show notes. So you can see that, and it's not a difficult to interpret report, like it shows in green, yellow, and red. Yeah, so, so you know, so you don't just yeah. have to start, don't just take omega-3s just because you heard it right now. 
test instead of guess. That would be ideal, but very unlikely anyone is, again, none of what um, Andrea and I are talking about here is medical advice, but very unlikely if you just start taking a, you know, a regular omega-3 from the, you know, a good quality one that you are going to cause a lot of problems. Right. Because omega-3 is interestingly higher dose. So this is like four grams is actually a prescription product in the US and Canada as well. Right. And B vitamins, because they are water soluble, so very unlikely you're going to overdose on them. And right. again, the same thing, you know, no one gets enough of the nutrients from only food. And we'll go into all the reasons and why that is so. Right. Because the quality of food and things like where they are harvested. Like I am in Alberta and Canada and some of the, you know, food comes from many, many, many kilometers away. <laughs> So a lot of the nutrients are no longer there. Then the soil quality. I mean, there, there's so many conversations about commercial, you know, commercial growing of food versus what back in the days we used to grow in our little garden and eat that. Right. And a hundred years ago, soil versus today soil and, yeah. and things like that. Uh, so anything else we, we need to talk about herbs too. So there's. Yes. So things like, you know, for example, um, what is a herb? Something that. Let us say something like um, valerian, valerian root. That is something that people use for sleep and things sleep, like that. Right. So that is a herb versus melatonin, which is again something people use for sleep, is a supplement. That means our bodies naturally make melatonin, but they don't make any, any valerian. So uh, that is the difference between... Mm, supplements versus herbs and herbs of course many of them have an upper safety limit just as some of the vitamins like for example vitamin d which is a fat soluble vitamin that and vitamin a both of them are fat soluble they do have a safety limit of course the safety limits are kind of for vitamin d the safety margin is very high we'll talk about all those in details what are the numbers you should look for yes we'll do a deep dive into yeah. all of the supplementation and a therapeutic supplementation that you can do so that you know the parameters of that so yes. let's uh tie a, a little bit of a bow on it and remind people that these are the five core strategies for um to improve your brain health and they, they come after, uh, they, they come because of the three foundations of brain health, which are optimal blood glucose, optimal blood pressure, and low inflammation. And when you can imply these strategies and pick the things that you want to do underneath here, you have a great framework for improving your brain health and your overall health. So the five core strategies are sleep, eat, move, mind, body, and therapeutic supplementation. And your brain will be healthier and you'll also be taking the steps necessary to prevent dementia, improve focus, and get rid of brain fog. So if you enjoyed this, uh, please click like and subscribe. Uh, we will have in the show notes the uh, information that Sh Shabnam mentioned. And you can also download the ebook, Five Ways to Get Rid of Brain Fog. Uh, at Dr. Shabnam Daskar's website. And there's other free resources at drcarmd.com. That's D-R-K-A-R-M-D.com slash free. Yes. Cheers, everyone. See you next time. See you. Bye now.